Resilience is the ability to persist over time. In the Manila Bay and other bays uh, that experience red tides, it is the marginalized that is affected in health and in economy. The engineering is the ability to absorb, thrive, and then recover. Uh, the faster you are able to recover, the more resilient. Sa Pilipino, ito ay katibayan at katatagan sa mahirap na sitwasyon at ang kakayahang bumangon muli. The ecological naman is the ability to adapt. Yung evolution of resilience vale to really innovate and be creative. Resilience is really being able to spring back from adversity, but it should have learning and therefore it strengthens you to be more resilient than before the adversity came to you. Before COVID-19, the Philippines was already on to SMT-based measures to improve its resilience capacity. With COVID, the country was awakened to the need for resilience for economic, health, and educational status as well. The country as a whole is, I think, not so resilient because while we have the capabilities, the opportunities, and the resources to cope with COVID-19, the whole body is suffering because the leadership and management is not working so well. When it comes to individual resilience, those who have more resources, capabilities, and opportunities will be more resilient than those who are not. A lot of the problems really may be interconnected by you have to look at it from a holistic point of view. It encompasses more than natural sciences or physical problem body, but also it gets into the ecological, biological, as well as social pangat. Among issues and problems we have are poverty, ecosystem destruction, climate change, and breathing. Much of our attention is placed only after the disasters happen. Uh, what we should do really is to take early action years before the hazard strikes. And we should put our attention and our resources into that type of planning. We need SMT-based transdisciplinary and inclusive approach to coping with possible hazards. The fragmentation of society needs to be resolved for resilience. 
communication uh, is very very important and we should communicate to the people using not just uh, scientific communication means but through arts music uh, understand the mindset of the Filipino people so we can communicate better well the way to move forward is interoperability so we have to do a lot of work as a person, as a community, and as an institution to really have resilience as one of the values of the Filipinos. Yung tunay na resilience na towards uh, improvement. Building resilience requires sustainable design inspired by transdisciplinary approach. To be sustainable, you have to be resilient. To be resilient, you have to be sustainable. Go natural go with nature's flow. Non-structural or natural interventions as well as good planning is the most sustainable. Finally, we need to harness and strengthen the Filipino spirit of Bayanihan. Pero dahil kami ay Nasa akademiko, kailangan natin maging nang mga Kailangan natin talaga ang kailangan natin not only for ourselves, but for a people as well. Resilience ng mga Pilipino towards the collective effort among communities and the strengthening of our Resilience Live. Hello everyone, good afternoon, and I'm happy to announce that we are now in our fifth episode of the Science Live webinar. My name is Ella, and I will be your host for today. I know it's a bit late, but I still want to greet you all with a happy new year, and I hope that your January has set you all for a productive and positive year ahead. So to start our program, again, the Science Live webinar series is brought to you by the UP NOAA Center and the UP Resilience Institute. In cooperation with the UNESCO International Geoscience Program, or IGCP. Together, the UP NOAA Center and IGCP seek to explore geoheritage as a tool in developing resilience to natural hazards. Our partners for this episode are the Lyceum of the Philippines Laguna Biological Society, the UPLB Interdisciplinary Study Center for Integrated Natural Resources and Environment Management, or UPLB INREM, the Association of Filipino Forestry Students, or APS UPLB, the UP Volcano Tectonics Laboratory, and the UP Rockhams. Our first speaker for this year is a senior lecturer in humanitarian engineering at the University of Sydney's School of Civil Engineering. His research focus revolves around the understanding of the interface and infrastructure, the interface of infrastructure and social systems, mainly to examine solutions for effective disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. His work looks at how participatory processes that integrate local and scientific knowledge can support safer and more inclusive infrastructure. Here to discuss his presentation on identifying archetypes of participatory flood risk governance under uncertain climate futures is Dr. Aaron Updike. Thank you for the introduction, Danelia. So just give me one second while I share my screen. Great. Um, so, Magandang uh, Hapon. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon sharing some of the, the research that we've been doing, really looking at how we can make better decisions around reducing disaster risks under um, the increasing escalation of climate change. And so my area of research sits in humanitarian engineering, which um, really is an emerging field that focuses on providing support to communities um, that are affected by disasters and conflict, as well as communities that are facing challenges in sustainable development. Um, I'd like to begin today just by recognizing and paying my respects to the elders and communities, past, present, and emerging, of the lands uh, that sit on the University of Sydney's campuses. Um, for thousands of years, they've shared and exchanged knowledges across innumerable generations um, for the benefit of all. 
So to start today's presentation, I would just like to start and, and maybe get you thinking and put an image in your mind. So I want you to imagine that the year is 2050 and coastal communities across the Philippines are facing more regular coast, coastal inundation um, from sea level rise, from typhoons. And some people might even say that this future has already arrived. Um, so this is an image actually taken recently from Bulacan. Um, and so we can see that this future might be closer than we might think. Um, but today, what I'm going to be exploring is really thinking about, will the actions that we're going to take in the decades ahead, will those lead to creating vibrant, thriving communities for future generations, or is there a different future that's in store? And so the decisions that we make to adapt to climate change are important, but I would argue that how we arrive at those decisions is a vital part of whether or not our disaster risk reduction uh, actions are going to succeed or not in the future. And so for today, what I'll be really trying to, to answer and unpack is, you know, how do we make better decisions to reduce climate risk? What are the pathways? What are the processes? How can we engage with communities better to do that? So a bit of background um, and conceptual framing for my presentation today. Um, so I am an engineer by training. So some of what I'll be talking about um, is the engineering side, um, but hopefully crossing over and, and speaking to a broader audience. Um, so, you know, if we think about the value of having more resilient structures, of buildings and infrastructure, um, it's quite evident when we look at disaster risk. Um, so from some recent research that we've done, for example, across the Philippines nationally, um, you know, we, we can see that in municipalities where there's a higher rates of substandard housing, um, they're up to 2.5 times more likely um, to, to experience typhoon related mortality. Um, so there's an obvious link there in thinking about why we should be investing in stronger infrastructure and buildings. But that's not necessarily enough. So if we think about where those buildings are situated, um, they're really embedded within a broader landscape, um, within the social fabric of our society. Um, so it's important that we conceptualize them in that way. So it's, it's useful for us to think about that connection um, as buildings being embedded within those social um, systems. Um, but of course, that's not it. Um, so I think we also need to be thinking about, um, of course, people at the center of that. Uh, and so for disaster risk reduction solutions, we really need to be working across and thinking of, across all of these scales um, to reduce those impacts. So some of the work that I'll be talking about today, just as a primer. Um, so we've been doing a lot of research in, in the municipality of Kumara in late Valete in partnership with the local government there um, since 2017, really, uh, and trying to look at ways that we can identify the risks that they're facing. Um, so this is an example of some of the, the um, storm surge risk mapping that we, we've worked with the local government on. Um, and this was utilizing, you know, a lot of the current tools that, that are out there. Um, so, for example, this was leveraging UP NOAA's um, storm surge hazard maps, which I'm sure many of you might be familiar with. Um, but then locally, what we were trying to do is add on to that. Um, so looking at incorporating localized vulnerability, um, both for buildings, but also for um, social aspects and social vulnerability to try to understand what the risk is that they're facing. Um, so this particular project um, had heavily involvement um, from a lot of the local barangays and communities. Um, so in 2019, it was actually awarded um, a Sasakawa Award nominee. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar, that's the UN um, Office for Disaster Risk Reduction's um, highest global recognition. Um, so while they didn't get the award that year, um, I think the nominee really speaks to um, the quality of some of the work that our partners have been doing locally in that area. But one of the questions really that emerged from this project um, is does, you know, all of this risk mapping that we're doing in the disaster risk management space, is it actually capturing what future risk is going to be? So again, if I go back and, and we look at those people, those buildings, those communities, that's constantly evolving and it's constantly changing. So if we think about what that might look under climate change, it could be very different. Um, and so the, the image that I'm showing here on the right, um, this is taken from the most recent intergovernmental panel for climate change. Um, showing the uncertainty that we have really in what our climate futures are going to be. Um, there's so many variables that we don't know, both um, on the natural hazard side, on climatic conditions, um, but also on our exposure. So where we are deciding to build and where people are actually located. Um, so this is really a challenge. And so today, what I'll be um, hopefully trying to unpack and address a little bit further is thinking about how local governments in the Philippines and local Filipino communities, um, how are they going to act under this uncertainty um, or potentially not? 
Um, and so in order to you know, answer this question and address it, uh, we uh, you know, had difficulty in, in beginning to grapple with it because climate change has not yet unfolded. So there's a number of different pathways and trajectories that we know that that might take um, as a result of where our, our reductions are globally um, and the impacts that that might have on local communities. And so we really need to be, you know, not only focused just on the science, though, we also need to be thinking about how people are going to act as that begins to evolve and change. And so in order to do that, um, we really adopted uh, a novel method in trying to gamify this um, and looking at the different scenarios and placing people into those different scenarios to see the types of decisions that they were making and understanding why they were doing that. Um, so over the, the course of the last year, um, we've developed a, a serious game. And so uh, this is really a research tool for us to, to think about learning kind of beyond just, um, you know, playing for fun, um, but thinking about sort of a learning or an outcome based, uh, you know, evolution of, of what a game can actually be. And so there's some tremendous examples um, within the Philippines, UPRI, for example, um, through Sakonwari, for example, is a, a really good example of a game that's been developed. Um, and so we, we built and, and really leveraged a lot of that knowledge um, in trying to utilize and develop this tool over the course of the last year. And so in, on the one hand, we wanted to create a tool that could be a little bit more specific, um, that was targeted on flood risk and incorporated climate risk into that. Um, so that it exposed local communities, local governments to the, you know, the current state of science that we have about what climate change impacts are going to look like in the Philippines. And so that was really the first um, aim of, of intention of this and really trying to bring different um, community groups, different local government agencies together to have a conversation. So really a facilitation um, and a, a conversation starter to thinking about the impacts of climate change in their own local communities. But the second aim of this was also trying to use the game to understand and actually look from a research perspective into trying to capture what those decisions were. So again, um, if we think about um, using the game as a way to explore what those futures might look like and how our local governments and um, how our communities might act. Um, it's a useful way to, to understand what is the environment that we can create that leads to better decisions and what are those characteristics of the group dynamics that we see. So that's what I'll really be focusing and, and talking a little bit further about today. So a little bit of an overview of, of what the game is, and then I'll, I'll kind of launch into talking a little bit further about some of the, the preliminary results and emerging results we have out of this, and to try to understand better ways that we can manage participatory governance. Um, so this is what the, the players are faced with. This is their boards in the game. Uh, and so this is their community. And so we've presented players with different zones, and those correspond to different probabilities of a flood potentially happening over the course of the game. Uh, and so we populate this and we, we fill this in with different locations. And so, you know, these would be locations and infrastructure or assets um, that all communities would have. So farms, for example, or they might have um, barangay halls, um, residential areas. Uh, they might have a basketball court, markets. And so those are all different um, assets that communities would value in different ways. And we've also assigned these a starting level of resilience. So when you see on the screen here, those numbers, um, we've defined sort of a um, where it begins. So how vulnerable is it? Um, what's the starting level of resilience for that particular asset in the game? Um, and of course, similar to a real community, that's different across those different assets. So in addition to this, um, as I mentioned, what the, the really key aspect of the game is, is um, climate change. So as um, players sort of uh, move through the game over a turn-based sort of iteration, um, they're forced and the risks evolve and change over the, the course of the game. And so we've utilized that IPCC um, trajectory um, and showing kind of the different pathways that the communities might be faced with. And so that's randomized um, over the course of, of different game iterations. Uh, so players are subjected each time they play the game to different scenarios that might unfold uh, according to climate change. So in the game, we typically play this um, with between four to seven players. Uh, and so they would assume different roles, um, whether that's a community role or a local government role. So um, you can see here an example of a, a player card that they might um, have and assume as part of the game. Uh, so for example, the planning officer, um, there's a little bit of information about you know, what they would step through on their particular turn. Um, and the two sort of key aspects of this is that they have um, a currency that they need in order to purchase or in order to implement different adaptation strategies 
in order to increase the resilience of different locations on the game board. Um, so on the left, the two different types of currencies that we've introduced uh, is pesos, uh, obviously. And then we've also introduced a social capital element. Um, so a power card um, where, you know, it's, we, we know this, uh, it's not always enough just necessarily to have the money to implement something, but we also need those connections and that capital in order to make projects happen. Um, on the adaptation side, um, so some of the things that we've incorporated into the game, so these are based on the, the current adaptation strategies that have been proposed uh, and, and really uh, an agenda that's been laid out by the Department of Science and Technology in the Philippines. Uh, we've also supplemented these with some additional ones from academic literature or research that have been shown for different ways that communities can be adapting to climate change impacts. Um, and so these range from everything from the easy stuff. So volunteering in our communities, um, which might not have a cost to a particular player, um, up to much more difficult or time intensive ones where it might require saving or it might require sharing of resources across the players in the actual game. Um, so you can imagine, um, you know, implementing a seawall for protection, um, there would be a higher cost of that than uh, if I were to implement, say, drainage uh, around a, a school, for example. And so we've tried to introduce the, the different trade-offs that players might um, have around that in the game and the different impact that can have on increasing the resilience of different locations. So what does a, a typical round look like? Um, so again, a player might have those two different types of currencies. Um, they might have, again, their menu of options that they can pick, and they might opt about where they want to try to um, you know, increase the resilience of different locations during their turn. Um, so it is turn-based and we typically play the, the game over three rounds. Uh, and that's kind of just a fix uh, to keep the game short and sweet. Um, but it also um, introduces a time element where there is an, uh, an endpoint to the game as well. So during the game at, at uh, each the start of each player's turn, um, there is a random chance of a flood event happening. So, uh, and those correspond to the different zones that we have on the game board. So in this, you can see, for example, uh, if say a, a flood card was pulled and it was in zones three and four, um, that would impact and we would roll dice to see what the impact of that flood would be. Uh, and that would remove or draw down or damage the resilience of all of those locations. So in this case, um, some of those locations, if they um, drop down to zero, then those locations are destroyed for the purposes of the game. And so the players are constantly battling to protect those locations over the course uh, of their turns. Uh, in addition to that, once a location re reaches eight resilience tokens, um, we would consider that you know, that's a, a sufficient level where maybe it's not going to be affected any longer by flood events. Um, so I'll talk about that as I come back into some of the presentation of the results at the end of today. Uh, in addition to that, so again, uh, as I mentioned, climate change is really a key piece of this. And so in each round, uh, as the players step through this, uh, there, the probability of, of climate change making those flood events worse it changes. And so that's something, again, that's randomized over the course of the game. So in this case, that flood might be larger or have a higher impact uh, according to some of those trajectories uh, in, in the actual game. So I've simplified the game for today, um, but we will have a free uh, a, a version of the game available if anyone's interested um, that's coming out soon where they can pilot it um, and use it. And we're also working so that there's multiple language versions of that if anyone's interested uh, in trying out a copy of the game as well. So um, some of the data that we have from that. So that's a, a quick snapshot and an overview of how we develop the game, um, the basics of kind of uh, functions about how players would interact in it. And so we've, over the course of the last year, have been collecting some data through different game workshops. And so we've run 11 of these so far with 62 different participants. Um, and we're continuing to run a lot more, um, including not just in the Philippines, but also in Indonesia to, to see how some of these um, decisions or dynamics change across different international settings. Uh, some of the data we've also collected is, is pre and post surveys. Uh, and we've also been trying to, and really the key element that I'll be talking about today is tracking the player actions. Um, so the conversations that they're having with their groups, um, the, the decisions that they make. So what types of adaptation strategies do they decide to invest in? Um, are they trying to save resources? Are they trying to share resources um, with other players? Um, so all the players, again, are working together in the game. And so we really want to try to understand what are those di dynamics? Um, so why are they making decisions? And what are those decisions that are actually unfolding during the gameplay? Um, so some of the, the, the findings that we have from this. So when are we seeing that individuals, um, both communities and local governments, when do they actually act? Um, and so what some of the data looks like from the actual research and the gameplay itself. Um, so on the left, what you're seeing here is some of our data tracking. And so what we've done is we've categorized those adaptation strategies into different levels of impact and also cost. 
So um, we can see sort of three groupings that we've made of those where there might be really no impact of that. So if you think about volunteering, um, it's it's a small impact, um, but you know that might not be a, a large impact on the gameplay, but there's not necessarily a cost that's associated with that. Um, whereas those higher impact, higher cost strategies, um, you know, we're really interested to see, well, what led players to actually achieve those? So that's kind of the three different classifications or groupings that we've made of those adaptation strategies that players could pick from. In addition to that, um, the game, uh, as I mentioned, it gets played over three different rounds. And so we've categorized really uh, to, to, to normalize, given that there might be different group sizes, uh, to look at those rounds as a basis to see are players and groups, are they acting early or are they acting maybe later in the actual gameplay? So what we get from this is an actual heat map that shows the number of adaptation strategies on average um, that are implemented across both the rounds as well as sort of the, the level of impact or cost that's associated with those. And so what we'd like to be seeing again, uh, maybe as a really positive outcome is that we're getting players to act early. Um, so again, we want maybe that, that bottom left um, and that's also a higher level of impact that's actually unfolding in the adaptation uh, options that they're picking in the game. So again, we've categorized this and classified this for all of the game sessions that we've been running. And so what we've started to see is kind of groupings where we would um, look at sort of late and low impact adaptation strategies that are implemented, shifted um, over to the games where we see that players and groups are really going um, kind of all in early in the game and there's a high level of impact. And so from this um, kind of as a, a, a basis, you can see and, and see the gradients or, or kind of the differences that emerge across the games that, that have been played. Um, so on the left, again, would be a grouping um, of those late and low impact. Um, on the right would be examples of some games that we have around earlier and higher impact adaptation. But the question that we had, um, and really at the start of this, and you might be asking, is, well, why do some of those groups uh, implement things earlier and have higher impact? And that's really the key question um, that I'll be unpacking and unfolding about some of the, the categorizations that we see of the group dynamics and why we see differences across these. So there's really three archetypes that have emerged from our analysis in the game sessions that we've run. Um, and so I'll unpack and talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first of these is what we're calling the hierarchical alliances. Um, so they're very top-down structures in our groups. Um, the passive enthusiasts um, are the laid back groups. Um, and so it's, it's groups that might be engaged, um, but there's not necessarily a strategy or direction. Uh, and then our last group is the deliberative strategists. And so we see that these groups um, tend to be very strategy oriented, where there's a lot of networking and coordination and thinking about the adaptation strategies that are being implemented. So to talk and, and expand a little bit on each of these. So our first one that we see uh, in terms of these community groups uh, and partnerships with local government. So these uh, alliances where there's hierarchy really driving a lot of the decision-making, we see that these happen in about one out of every five game sessions that we've been running. Uh, and so some of the, the characteristics that we see of these groups is they tend to be rather homogenous. Um, so what I mean by that is they might have uh, individuals from the same government department. They might be the same community organization. It might be the same gender or age groups. Uh, so there's not necessarily a lot of diversity in the group itself. And there tends to be one or two individuals that really are dominating the conversation. Um, so they're really taking ownership or leadership in terms of what the group is actually doing um, and how the actions are unfolding over the course of the game. So I'll come back to some of the adaptation preferences uh, in a little bit more detail as we compare across these. But the key thing that I want to take away just from this group that we see is there's a relatively high percentage, so about half of the adaptation actions that are implemented, um, they're not necessarily that significant. So they tend to be on the lower side uh, or not necessarily that high. Um, but we do see that some of the groups so um, are implementing those high impact uh, adaptation strategies. So it was mixed across some of the games that we saw. So in some instances, it was much more towards the, the um, lower in, end of the impact spectrum. Um, whereas other games, we actually saw that there was more of this as compared to other games because of that leadership role. And I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. Again, that second group, so the passive enthusiast group. So we see that this is about half of the groups. And some of this is that these groups don't necessarily know what to do with the climate change uncertainty. So they're not sure about what that future is going to look like. Uh, and they're mixed. So for some of the groups we saw, this was um, diverse groups. In other instances, again, it might have been much more homogenous in terms of the demographics of who is actually involved. 
the, the collaboration itself, it sometimes was ad hoc. So what we would tend to see in this instance is you might have two players or two individuals or roles that are talking to each other, um, but it's not necessarily widespread across the entire group. And that would come and go. So we might see that happening at certain moments and key moments in the actual uh, gameplay itself, or uh, you know, that might start to fade at other moments. Uh, and so again, you can start to see the adaptation preferences uh, for these. So a little bit higher in terms of the, the, the low impact, but we didn't see actually for this group, there was no high impact strategies that were actually implemented um, across any of the game sessions that we see emerging for this particular archetype. And then our last group that we see and last archetype, so those deliberative strategists, um, we see this in about a third of the game sessions that we've been running, is they tend to be very diverse. So we, it's when we brought together, for example, a community group uh, and multiple local government departments. So you might have a planning office, um, you might have a, an agricultural office representative. So a lot of diversity in thinking, in different age. Um, and so th there's uh, a lot of different perspectives being brought into these particular groups. And so they tend to be very network oriented uh, in the decisions that they're making. And there's a lot of discussion about the strategy about what to implement. Um, so again, uh, lots of discussion um, really over the iterations of all of the, the rounds that we saw across the game. So some key takeaways that we see in terms of the impact across these adaptation preferences. Um, and I guess some, some key takeaways maybe to pay attention to or highlight. So again, that, that first group, so where we see these very top-down leadership structures, is we start to see that um, they really had the highest instance of no impact. So we have a lot of individuals that are really waiting on a leader in order to take action, and they're not really sure about what they should be doing. They're looking to a, a leadership role to actually act. Um, and so we, as a result of that, we see a lot of inaction that's occurring around adaptation choices in these actual games. Um, conversely to that, so um, the strategy group, we, we start to see a bit higher, so particularly um, on the, the higher uh, end of the impact spectrum. So like I said, maybe that's something that you would expect out of this, um, but uh, we've also tracked and looked this across um, each of the, the archetypes that emerge. So we can see the patterns that emerge and, and also kind of what those recovery trajectories look like. So um, these are actually showing for each round. So to kind of walk you through what we're looking at, um, on the left side, what we're seeing is the total number of resilience points um, or tokens really assigned to those locations over the game. So each of these game is starting at the same point um, or sort of the same starting level of resilience. Um, and that's evolving and going up and down. So as players are adding adaptation strategies onto the game board, um, onto locations, the overall resilience of their communities come up. Um, and then as a flood event happens, and so we see those drops is where there might be damage um, to those particular assets. But we can see across all of these that there starts to become a pattern that emerges. So again, we start to see that those deliberative strategies groups, there's a little bit more consistency overall towards an upward trajectory. Um, the hierarchy, so again, we don't have necessarily a lot of evidence for that, but we start to see a much wider spectrum. Um, in particular, we see the lowest group that we actually uh, involved in the research was actually uh, from that group. So again, a wider end of the spectrum where it can go kind of either way for those top-down leadership and governance structures. So when we look at, again, those decisions and some of the performance outcomes for each of these archetypes, um, just to walk you through some of the ways that we've tried to evaluate this. Um, so if I look at kind of the center of this circle, um, what that would represent in this instance is the number of locations that were destroyed. So uh, on average for a game group. So that's kind of that core circle. So if, say, for example, a group lost a school, if they lost a residential area, um, we would add those up at the end of the game. And that's what that is representing on average. So uh, for example, this is looking at our first archetype. Uh, so in this case, what we would see is on average, those groups lost about four and a half locations um, on the game board. Whereas the circle on the dash line, kind of on the outside, is giving an indication of well, what was the total number of um, locations that were actually made fully resilient. Um, so again, in the game, that was representing sort of those eight tokens that players are, are working towards. Um, so for this one, we see is that it was about double. So um, in instances, so they're protecting certain assets um, and then other ones, maybe because they were not able to protect them, um, they're lost during the actual gameplay. So we've tracked this and looked at this again across each of those three archetypes. Um, so again, the first one is looking at that hierarchy. The middle one is passive. And then the, the right one, we're looking at that strategy group. So when we look across these, I know this is a little bit difficult to tell. Um, so what we'll kind of unpack and I'll, I'll present this in a different way is looking at the ratios between these. So if we look at um, the ratio of the, the number of locations that were made resilient versus the locations that are lost, we can start to understand a little bit better about what's going on in some of these archetypes and game dynamics. So again, that first group, the hierarchy group, 
Um, so on average, what we see is that ratio is about 2.25. Um, and we start to see that that increases across each of these archetypes. And so that's quite significant. And so really the main takeaway from this that we see is that the groups, particularly that are the strategy group, um, where there's a, a diversity of perspectives, is that there really tends to be much more risk balancing that's going on. So those groups, because of that diversity, because of that coordination and discussion, we're starting to see that they're balancing the risk across. So it's not necessarily that they're making um, the most locations resilient, um, but they're also balancing that and they're losing less locations um, or less assets than some of these other top-down governance structures. So that's quite significant when we think about trying to theorize um, and also think about some of the practical implications for how we want to structure our governance structures at a local level. So again, some of the key takeaways um, and to, to kind of pull things back out is really it's important that we focus on co-producing knowledge with communities and with government. Uh, and so, you know, as an example of that, looking at some of the governance structures that we've seen, um, you know, there's much more collective sustained demand for disaster risk reduction measures where we have that discourse, um, where we brought in a, a diversity of different perspectives. There's a healthy conversation that evolves um, over time and that's sustained. Um, and again, really the big thing, and I think the, the really interesting insight from this is that there's much better risk balancing. So it's not necessarily about putting all of our eggs in one basket when we talk about future risk for climate change. Um, as a result of that, we might actually end up with worse outcomes for our communities. Uh, and so those, again, uh, those uh, much more strategic groups, that diversity of perspectives uh, is achieving those outcomes in a much better way. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, I just wanted to acknowledge that this research um, was funded by the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research. Um, there's been a ton of partners involved in this. Um, so I just wanted to give particular attention and thanks um, to UPRI um, and particularly a few colleagues, um, Joy Santiago, Vic Mendoza, um, Trixie Dino, uh, and also um, Professor Mahar Lagmai for their support. Um, so we've worked quite closely with them on this. Um, so this is just one component of a, a much larger research project that's ongoing, really trying to understand local climate change uh, impacts on flood risk in the Philippines. Uh, and we've had a number of other partners, um, and I just want to also particularly thank the local government uh, in Carigara, who's been a, a fantastic partner for a lot of this research. Um, and some wonderful insights coming out of it. So again, thank you for, for listening today. Thank you very much, Doc Aaron, for that very interesting and informative presentation. I, as a forester, I appreciate very much this kind of projects where we are able to um where we are able to bridge the knowledge gap between scholars and the public. As much as specialists are experts in their field of studies, valuable data are really sourced from the locals and making them understand the process of our um our processes of analyzing provides them more context to our studies and it enables us to extract more data from these communities. And I would also like to add that um the Philippines is ranked first in the um, World Risk Report in terms of vulnerabilities. And that says a lot about the importance and the urgency of more informed and engaged communities in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Scientists, researchers, and the government in itself can only do so much and up to only some extent in addressing the pressures of climate change. This is not to pressure our every our civilians but to encourage more people to be more active in in playing a role for our environment and our communities and be part of the decision making process again be climate uh climate warriors guys <laughs> so up next we will be having our q and a session uh, so a few reminders to our participants here at zoom you may use the Zoom reaction button to raise your hand and wait for the host mute to unmute you before speaking. For our FB and YouTube participants and also to our Zoom participants, you may also opt to send your questions through the chat box below. So now I open the floor for our question and answer session. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of 
the of representatives from the municipalities of Carigara who were part of the activities highlighted in Dr. Aaron's presentation. Hello po! <laughs> So while we're waiting for other participants to ask their question, uh can I ask first, Dr. Iron? Of course. So um previously I've worked with uh Upland communities as well. And I'm curious about what challenges did you encounter during your activities, particip uh particularly in cloud risk planning? Was there hesitations from the communities or any challenges that you have encountered? Yeah, so I, mean, I think um, one of the wonderful things about the communities we've worked with is, is that they've been so uh, engaged in the topic. So I think that they're, uh, the gaming element of it really helps, I think. So any opportunity that we have to distill scientific concepts down into much more digestible formats, I think that that's really fantastic for communities. Um, so I think that helped and really overcame a lot of the barriers that we faced. But I think that there still are challenges really trying to translate the science. Um, and so even as a, you know, a researcher who is based in, you know, engineering and the natural sciences, um, our understanding the impacts that climate change will have at a very local level, and we even have a hard time answering that. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty with that. And I think that the, the real challenge when we've worked with communities is trying to communicate that in, in a way that they understand. Um, so what does that, because they're looking for that uncertainty to be answered. Um, and it's not something that even us as a research community necessarily have figured out. Um, so we have plausible you know, pathways that might come out of that, um, but really trying to distill that down to actionable um, ways that communities can, can make decisions. So I think um, the partnership on our side, I think particularly with the local government in Karagara has just been fantastic um, and really trying to bridge that. So understanding from a policy perspective, how communities and the information they want to take action um, and how our research can better support that. Truly those um, LGUs or other stakeholders that are very cooperative are a bless to <laughs> us researchers and scientists. <laughs> Um, I've seen that some of our participants are very um, interested in obtaining a copy of your research paper. Do you uh, have a way to share your research paper? Um, we'll definitely have a way to circulate that after. Um, so we're actually just in the process of finalizing and that. So I expect actually within the next two weeks that we'll have a, a draft um, version that's being submitted for publication that I can share uh, with anyone that's interested. Um, and as I mentioned also that we will have a free um, version of the game that anyone's interested in, in trying it out. And we'd love to get your feedback on that as well. Um, so we've really tried to utilize and design the game in particular in a way that the, the game pieces, for example, um, can be easily substituted. Um, so, you know, a lot of the early feedback that we had from communities is that they might not have access to that. Um, so we've really tried to make it simple where the entire game can be um, really printed out just using um, standard A4 sheets. Uh, you can substitute it with whatever you have. So if you had some rocks, for example, um, or stones, you could certainly substitute that for a lot of the game pieces. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're also working on different translated copies of that. So um, to date, um, we'll definitely have a, a Filipino version um, as well as a Warai version kind of for the first iteration. Um, but we welcome if anyone's interested in assisting with translation or other copies of the game um, to make that more accessible. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we have our, our, we also have a question from one of our um, Zoom participants, Sir Gio. Okay, you may now unmute and ask your question. Hey, hello. Yeah. Uh, I I have uh, actually two. Uh, one question and also one uh, reflection on the, uh, on the uh, methodology. It's very. Uh, I I I'm Gio and I'm uh, from the UP Nova Center and also the planning. Uh, component. So most of the time, we when we assess uh, municipalities uh, uh, in creating their planning document, it is very important to create or generate as much information uh, as uh, truthful and, of course, from all the stakeholders that are present uh, at that time. And gamification is a very important tool to uh, for them to, to clear, adapt. Clear. Yeah. To, to understand and appreciate the activities for planning Hello, the municipality. Uh, yes, Sir Mahar. So uh, my, my question is uh, uh, for the expansion and scaling of the, the game, are you looking into also uh, a, a digital uh, uh, digital uh, 
uh, method or uh, activity that uh, can be used. So uh, not only uh, uh, you, we we can get information even on the uh, uh, using the the, the internet uh, for uh, for planning purposes and research purposes. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, at the onset of actually developing the game tool, we had a lot of discussions about should it be digital or should it be something that's more um, tabletop. Hello, so Aaron, are you still there? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, sir is happy. That's okay. Um, so I'll just quickly answer that. So I, I think um, ultimately what we really saw the value in is that a lot of local governments, they might not necessarily have access or a lot of participants, particularly within communities, might not have access to digital tools. Um, well, I think that that's increasing. Um, we did want and, and took that into consideration, but I think it would be a great sort of iteration of it to, to try to expand into the digital space. Um, so I think that there's, uh, you know, some maybe great ideas or if anyone's interested in, in partnering to think about kind of what comes next with it, um, that would really be fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Aaron. Um, I think Sir Mahar, Sir Mahar, you have a question, Bob. Okay. Um. So we can address other questions. Um. One interesting question we have here in the chat box is from Miss Laura De La Cruz. Um, just wondering why you choose a board game as a medium for your research tool. What does a board game have that other me methods don't? Had there been also cases where it has proven more effect has proven effective in the past? Yeah, so um, kind of building on my I guess response to to Geo, I think that really what we wanted to ensure is that the digital access, while it might open up new possibilities, we saw really that the ability to bring people together, um, you know, in a lot of local planning decisions in particular, we see that that's often the medium, and so we wanted to try to replicate that environment as much as possible. Um, so that was really kind of the decision in order to to move to a tabletop. Um, there were some other iterations of games that we did discuss. Um, some of that really came through local consultation. So we did um, a lot of work before we actually started designing the game, particularly in Leyte, um, to try to understand local games that had been used, different norms. Uh, so a lot of that was incorporated to try to ensure that when um, local governments or communities utilize the game, that they actually had a, a base level of understanding um, where there wasn't sort of a, a steep learning curve at the beginning of it. So those were some of the things that we considered on the game format. Um, but like I said, I think that there's pros and cons to different uh, approaches, and particularly thinking about scaling it. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in the digital space um, to, to reach wider audiences potentially. Um, so I think those are just trade-offs we have to consider um, when we look at these types of methods or this types of research. Mm -hmm. And as researchers, we like to explore other ways to make people um, more engaged and be more um, approachable to, to locals. So I think that is um, one um, advantage as well of making it a game. Um, we also we have another question from Sir um, Sir Renvik Louis. He has a clarific um sir, sorry so from Sir. Virglin Palarca. So he has a clarification. He missed the first part. Is the board game designed based on the region mentioned or it, or is it based on an actual location? Hmm. So we intentionally designed the game so that the community was not um, a specific area. And so part of the reason for that was is that any community, um, we tried to really incorporate elements that they would expect to see um, in their, their own local government um, area. And so we that was part of the reason or, or kind of thought behind that. Um, we've also had some interesting sort of suggestions or iterations where communities can really place those assets or locations where they actually are in their community um, or the starting level of resilience that they actually have. Um, and so that's a way that we've worked to, I guess, localize the game so that the context makes sense to, you know, different communities who might be trying to utilize it um, as a facilitation tool, um, but also still keep it generalizable so that it's not so focused um, just in one area. So we really do want the tool to be accessible so that um, different local governments, um, if they're interested in using it as a, a tool to engage with communities um, or different local government units, um, either across different local government units or also within, um, to, to have a conversation starter about the ways that they're they're uh, making adaptation decisions. Mm, okay. 
So, so related to that um to that question as well. Sir and Vic Louis Cortez asked, is the board game designed for a specific audience or is it crafted to be easily grasped by a broader audience? Yeah, so we um initially what we were targeting is really at the local government level. Um and so the initial target audience was really focused, I would say, on, on different departments um, at the local local government level. That sort of evolved. And I think um, through a lot of the workshops that we ran, we brought in different community groups. So SKs, for example, um, or, or um, also different um, associations. And I think in a lot of ways that a general audience was able to engage with the game better than we thought. Um, and so I think some of the feedback we've had is actually adapting and using it for, for different audiences. So um, we haven't tried this yet, but we've had some um, uh, suggestions or demand really to try it even with different youth groups, for example, or kind of at the school level, uh, which is something that we're, we're looking into maybe for, for future applications of the game um, for groups that might be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Doc Arod. Um, we have lots of questions from our audience and one from Sir or from Sir Nu Sunil Kadka. Uh, what are your what are the recommended steps or strategies for advancing zone four and zone three communities? Yeah, so I think um, the zones when we've created those in the game, we've intentionally made zones to be more or less susceptible to flood impacts. Uh, and so really what we're trying to get communities thinking about is there's trade-offs that they're necessarily going to have to make with the resources that they have. So when we look at um, those areas that are coastal or they might be um, along riverbank areas, we know that those are areas that might be more susceptible to, to flood impacts. So it, it's really um, about communities making those decisions. And so I think something when we design the game and the conversations we've had is there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. So every community is going to have different assets that they prioritize. Um, but the game gives them kind of a safe way to try out what those strategies might result in um, and have a conversation about the, what they actually want to prioritize. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the, the key takeaways that we've seen behind a lot of players when they walk away from it uh, is that they've had a, a better understanding about what do they actually value within their community. And I think that itself is a really positive outcome of, of immersing themselves kind of into the gameplay. Mm -hmm. And um, that way we meet, we see more... Um... We, we see more of the attitudes of these communities and we can um, we can document it and uh, share it with other communities that share the same issues or even um, advantages in their environment. Um, so we also have another question that is related to the previous question. So can that game, the serious game, can be used among students as well? Was it customized for your community or like stakeholders only? So yeah, we've definitely had a lot of interest. Like I said, we haven't actually trialed it yet with a student um, kind of demographic group, but based on some of the initial feedback that we've had from participants um, that have undertaken and participated in the game, um, the early indication is that it would be suitable. So like I said, if anyone's interested in, in trying it with a youth group um, or uh, sort of, uh, dip, you know, maybe a younger audience, um, we'd love to get some feedback on that. Thank you for that talk, Aaron. So um, we have one question again from Ms. Ida. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Aaron, for your very useful presentation. I want to ask regarding the board game used in this participatory activity. Are there any differences, differences in the decision taken regarding mitigation based on age preferences? Um type of education or culture the differences? Yeah, so we um, admittedly don't have conclusive results on that yet. Um, it is data that we've collected. So some of the data we have in the, the, the pre and the post surveys is around the demographics of the participants. Um, so that's something that we're still undertaking the analysis on at this stage. So kind of the first step in the analysis has just been on the group dynamics, um, but we are looking into that. Hopefully in, in the coming months, I'll have a, a more definitive answer on the ways that those um, characteristics of individuals might be impacting um, choices or, or adaptation decisions. Thank you, Doc. So us and our participants are very interested in the analysis that you will do in the next month. <laughs> so <laughs> we have questions again from our participants. Um, were there other methods considered in order to teach concepts concepts of resilience? For example, something more traditional such as classes. 
Um, yeah, so that's something that we considered. So as I mentioned, we really viewed the game. So on the one hand, it was a learning tool. And so I think that there's lots of different formats that we could engage in, in trying to share um, you know, disaster risk knowledge, um, CCA, so climate change adaptation knowledge at a local level. Uh, I think really one of the key things that we've seen with the game is it's a more engaging format. Um, so rather than being passive, the players and the individuals participating in it, they have to actually make decisions. Um, so there's some accountability to the learning process itself. So I think that that's been really positive. Um, so like I said, it wasn't necessarily strictly in this case, and, and as the project was conceptualized, not necessarily just on sort of teaching the concepts, um, but we were also interested in working with the communities that we're partnered with to understand um, and give them some feedback on the ways that they're making decisions. Um, so that's part of the reason that we made it um, a more interactive format. Thank you, Doc. Um, so we have questions here from Miss Divine Dasag. So she asked, what is the game called again? And what are the advantages we will get from this game? Yeah, so we actually don't have a name yet. So we'd love to crowdsource some ideas for that. Um, so that's kind of still a work in progress at this stage. But the uh, really the learning outcomes, I'd be happy to share any of that in some of the materials that we've developed. Um, so we do have some clear sort of learning objectives that we wanted participants to take away. Um, so that was part of kind of the educational design component of the game. Uh, so like I said, I can share that in more detail if anyone's interested, but really some of the things that we wanted to see players um, taking away is really the collaborative nature of disaster risk reduction and adaptation. It's not something that a single stakeholder group can necessarily do, um, and that we need to be sharing and coordinating those resources in order to really have the impact that we're, we're hoping to see. So to our participants who can suggest a witty name for the game, you may reach to Sir Aaron. So our question again from one of our participants here. He is curious, how do you select the group of participants for each group who participate in game workshop mm. to capture the differences in the resilience in a given locality? Also, how many groups should perform the game workshop for a locality? And is there a rule of thumb on the number of participants for each group participating in the game workshop. Yeah, so we um, when we initially started this, we intentionally ran separate workshops. So we would have, for example, just the planning office um, sort of team uh, undertake the game together. We'd have maybe the engineering office, the agricultural office. Uh, we did that intentionally because we wanted those groups to be um, the same. So we wanted people that were familiar with working each other um, to undertake the game. And then we would often sort of um, mix those up uh, and have much more diverse groups. So that was some of our thinking in terms of how we selected the participants. But really, we wanted any stakeholder group at a local level that might have a, a stake uh, in climate change adaptation to be involved in the process. So we do have some key sort of roles uh, in the player roles, um, but certainly anyone can undertake it outside of just those roles. So we've tried to identify sort of the, the key local um, departments that might be involved in some of those adaptation decisions. But um, as I mentioned, that there, there are other ones that um, could undertake it. And certainly if um, a local government unit was interested in using this as kind of a planning tool, I think it's really up to them to decide, you know, how many people they want to invite. Um, it's really, uh, it's not something I can prescribe because I think that they know their locality best and who needs to be involved in that conversation. So I think um, the more people that um, could undertake it or the more diverse groups, kind of as we saw in some of the results, um, it leads to, you know, um, better conversations about how and why they should be making adaptation decisions. Thank you, Dr. And so it seems that our many of our participants are very interested in this game and maybe they're waiting for you to help them roll it out to their communities. <laughs> Thank you again to our participants for actively participating in our Q&A session. And of course, thank you to our speaker, Dr. Aaron, for sharing your knowledge on participatory flood risk planning. Earlier, one of our, uh, I, would just, I would just also like to note that earlier, one of our audience asked about the recordings of our episode. So we'd also like to announce that Today, that our episode today and all our previous episodes are available for viewing in our UPRI YouTube page. Okay, So, of course, before we officially end today's episode, we would like to request everyone to open your videos for a quick photo.
Smiles ready. One, two, three. Second page. <laughs> Second page. One, two, three. Okay. Third page. One, two, three. Are we good? To our photographer? <laughs> we are good. Okay. So, thank you all to our participants for the very beautiful smiles. And at this point in time, we now move on to the end of our webinar. Once again, this webinar has been brought to you by the UP NOAA Center and the UP Resilience Institute in cooperation with the UNESCO International Geoscience Program or IGCP. We would also like to thank again our partners, the Lyceum of the Philippines Laguna Biological Society, the UPLD Interdisciplinary Studies Center for Integrated Natural Resources and Environment Management or UPLD INRAM, the Association of Filipino Forestry Students of UPLB, the UP Volcano Tectonics Laboratory, and the UP Rockhounds. Our next episode will be on the 29th of February, so stay tuned in our UPRR Facebook page for announcement on our next speaker and featured topic. Please be reminded that participants will be issued a certificate of attendance once they have completed the evaluation form after the webinar. You may find the link to the form in the chat box below. Lastly, to our webinar participants, we will keep the Zoom meeting to allow you all to fill out the evaluation form. Thank you once again to our participants, to our speaker, Dr. Aaron, and see you all at the next session of the Resilience Live webinar. Once again, my name is Ella, and it has been a pleasure being your host for this afternoon. To all participants, please be advised that we will be closing the webinar in five minutes. Please make sure you have filled out the evaluation form. Thank you.